So last week we did John 15, and I think we stopped right at the end where Jesus is talking about abiding. Um, if you recall in 14, Jesus has already mentioned uh, that a helper is coming in his place. He uses the word helper. He calls him the Holy Spirit, um, but he uses different terms for that in John 14. In 15, he kind of takes a break from talking about the helper coming and starts talking instead about abiding in Christ, right? So this is what we talked about last week. But at the very end of 15, he picks back up on the same idea. He starts to prepare the disciples for the idea that when he leaves, things are going to get tougher for them. There's going to be suffering and persecution and things are going to get rough. We'll talk about what exactly that means. But in preparation for that, if you look at John 15, 26, um, Jesus is making several promises, one of them being the persecution makes sense. It's not because God has abandoned you, right? Because that's a big concern that people would have. Think about the story of Job. The contention from his friends was always, God has abandoned you, and that's why these bad things are happening, Right? So it's easy to think in the experience of suffering, you're suffering because either you've done something wrong or God has abandoned you, right? So Jesus is preparing them to say, no, you are exactly where God has you because I was persecuted, right? And if I am being persecuted and you represent me, you should be persecuted the same way that I was. So Jesus is gonna lay out the way that that works. The world hates me, so the world is going to hate you. And if the world doesn't hate you, that's a problem. He's going to say, it's actually a positive thing that the world hates you, because that proves that you're my disciples, right? But now he has to, Jesus has to set up the disciples with why it's going to be okay, because this is also devastating news. I'm leaving you, and it's going to get a lot worse for you, right? So, like, Jesus is, you know, ditching right when things are going to get harder, right? But Jesus reintroduces, brings back the person of the Holy Spirit and introduces him again in uh, 1526 and continues to talk about what the Holy Spirit is actually going to do after Jesus leaves in order to keep the disciples. Okay, so this is where we pick up in 26. Jesus says, when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. There is a, a, a very silly debate in church history for several hundred years about um, from where does the Holy Spirit proceed? Who is it that is sending the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes. Is the Holy Spirit sent from the Father, or is the Holy Spirit sent from the Father and the Son? Okay, it seems like a very minute difference, right? Or um, I like to say like a, a difference, a distinction without a difference, right? You're arguing about something and it doesn't make a difference either way. But it says right here, exactly, that's why I'm bringing this up. So this was a key verse in, if you look back at different creeds, the Apostles' Creed or um, the Nicene Creed, they talk about these sorts of things. And there's very specific language that they argue about for centuries about the Holy Spirit. Because there are certain things that you cannot say about the Holy Spirit. You can't say that God creates the Holy Spirit to send, because we believe that the Holy Spirit is part of God, right? And therefore, in the same way that Jesus, uh, uh, sorry, that Christ, the second person in the Trinity, has always existed and is not created by God, the Holy Spirit is not created either, okay? But then the question is, okay, but if he's always been around, why hasn't he been doing this with us forever, right? So now the discussion is more, the Holy Spirit proceeds, not, which is a chosen term for a specific reason, not created, but proceeds, it's emanating. He's, um, he's not generated by God, but he proceeds, he's sent out as, a, as an expansion of who God is, right? That we can interact with in a way that we can't always interact with God the Father because we don't have direct access to God the Father 
as sinful human beings, right? But the Holy Spirit can live in us, right? Can do things in us that God the Father can't do because he exists in heaven in holiness, right? And so the Holy Spirit, in the same way that Christ interacts with us in, the, in ways that the Father can't or doesn't, the Holy Spirit does the same sort of thing. So the word proceeding from the Father and from the Son is a very specific word. We tend to read over those sorts of things when we read the creeds or we'll, you know, every now and then we'll like read them from church or talk about them from the pulpit or something. But those, there's a reason, every word in those creeds is debated and teased out and focused on, and each word is chosen for a specific reason. Okay, this verse here is why they argue about whether the Holy Spirit is sent from God or sent from God and the Son. Here, it seems to kind of explicitly indicate that the Son, Christ, when he gets to heaven, will send the Spirit to us, right? This seems to be what happens when we see Acts, right? Jesus comes back, and what does he do in the upper room? He breathes on his disciples, and if you recall, I think we've talked about this, the word for breath and the word for spirit are the same word, right? So he spirits on the disciples and they receive the Holy Spirit. And in that sense, it is quite literally that the Holy Spirit is sent from the Son, right? As a gift from the Father that's also a gift from the Son. We're going to see a lot of stuff in this chapter and I think in 17. It gets very confusing. Um the role, the function, the differences, the similarities between the members of the Trinity. Jesus is saying things about God and saying things about himself and saying things about the Holy Spirit. And people argue about a lot of this sort of stuff um, and try to make distinctions between this is something that only the Father does, this is something only the Spirit does. There's contradiction here because Jesus says, I don't judge anyone here. But over here he says he does judge, but only judging according to what the Father tells him. We'll get into all of this sort of stuff. Um, but it's also important to remember, people debate this for centuries, right? So we benefit from what other people have said for centuries. We, we aren't grasping at straws when we're trying to navigate these sorts of things. What is the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? And what does that look like now? And what did that look like in eternity past and all these sorts of things, okay? People have thought about these for 2,000 years, and we benefit from a lot of the work that they have done. Good? Okay, let's look at 16. Jesus gives a reason for saying everything that he has said thus far in chapter 14 and 15. So in 16, 1, he says, I've said all these things to you to what? To keep you from falling away. So again, he's leaving and things are going to get tough. And everything that Jesus has said so far is intended to keep them. We're going to talk about this also because Jesus will come and say that he has kept them. That everything that he has done since he chose them has kept the disciples where they're supposed to be. Mainly with him, right? Except for Judas because Judas was already determined not to be with him, right? But it seems like this is the reason for everything we've read in 14 and 15 is to keep the disciples, to prepare them for what's to come. He goes on to say, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And they'll do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. So what's he saying here? They will put you out of synagogues. Um. People will look at this and say this is like anachronistic. It's out of time. Like people in John's time are being kicked out of synagogues, but people in Jesus' time aren't, is, is the way the argument goes. So they, they will look at this and say, Jesus didn't really say this. This is just John telling his audience that Jesus said this. I don't really buy that. Um, we see these sorts of ter terms used elsewhere. Um, and it seems to be preparation for what is actually going to happen. Believers in Christ are eventually removed from synagogues. Um, whether it's social pressures where they remove themselves, or there's this idea that um, the synagogues develop part of their ritual where they um, include a blasphemy against heretics as part of their like order of service, and that a, a Christian, a, a Jesus believer, would not be able to share in that, that prayer. 
of, of saying anybody who's a heretic should, is, is a blasphemer because for them, the heretics are the people who believe in Jesus. So the Jesus believers w- would, in that sense, be excluded from synagogue worship. It's all kind of speculation. Say that again. How do you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there gets to a point where up until 70, every Christian is a Jew. Right? In one way or another, they all consider themselves to be part of the Jewish religion, even if they're Gentiles who are coming in and becoming part of the Christian way. That's a whole thing that they have to navigate. But they're, be- they're becoming part of the Jewish religion in their kind of understanding. All of that changes after the temple is destroyed. Um, and I think we've talked about this in class, where the people who believe in Jesus and the people who don't really have to reevaluate how they understand their religious practice now. But yes, prior to the temple being destroyed, it is a significant concern for the religious leaders that there are people teaching heresy everywhere, right? And so, yes, Paul is going around and trying to root out the heretics and bring them back and hold them accountable and put them under trial or kill them. The Romans tried not to care for the most part. In 66... There's a rebellion that takes place where the Jews in Jerusalem try to overthrow Rome. That is what gets Rome involved. And then Rome comes in in 70 and wipes everybody out and just takes over the temple and destroys it. Um, the whole, that, that's one of the reasons that the, Jew, the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem don't want Christianity to take off. Because in Rome, there aren't, you're not allowed to have new religions. So as long as Christianity belonged to Judaism, it was fine. But once so the Jews couldn't really come out and say, no, they're not part of us, because then they would get in trouble also, right? And so there's this whole distinction where the Romans really try not to get involved, and because every time that they do, they end up slaughtering a bunch of people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I don't know that the Romans see much of a distinction between, between Jews and Christians prior to 70. Um, I don't think they care enough to know because they are in charge of so many different religious groups and peoples and um, what would we call them? Uh, indigenous religions that are kind of spread out throughout the empire. So I don't know that they care enough to bother with like the theological distinction, um, at least at this point, right? But we see that in Acts where at one point the Romans suddenly realize, wait, they're just debating finer points of Judaism. Right. Because even even... Jesus and his followers, they agree with the Pharisees on almost everything. The only thing they disagree with is that the Messiah has come, right? And so that's their whole debate. And yeah, the Romans don't care about that at all, right? In the same way that we don't care about minutia of other religious theological debates, right? Most of us don't really care about, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, the difference in Shiites and Sunnis, right? We, I mean, we, we know that they're kind of a different thing, but for us, we don't care enough to learn what the differences are, to distinguish between the different types, and to figure out who believes in what, and we don't really care enough, right? Some of us might, some of us from like an intellectual perspective, or we know people where it's important to them, but for the for most of us, it doesn't really matter enough for us to invest time and learning and concentration to learn the differences. But then later, when Christians are the lion. That happens later, yeah. The lion part was a Yeah. Um, so Jesus goes on to say, whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. This might be, just be a setup for what's going to happen to Jesus, right? They kill Jesus thinking they're offering service to God, which they're not. But then in like a bigger, you know, in John's perspective, they really are, right? They really are offering service to God because... Christ on the cross is what's going to accomplish everything that has been promised so far, right? And so it, it's kind of ironic, I guess, in, in, a, in a Johannine, and in, in the way that John uses irony, they think they're offering service to God when they're not, but oh, really, they are, right? So there's, there's layers and layers of, of what he really means. They will not, let's look at verse three. They won't do these things, uh, or sorry, they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. What is the source of all sin at any point in time? 
it is not knowing God or Christ, right? This, this is the sin. Anything that they do, any sin that they commit is because they don't know God, because they've been separated from him, right? Um, I think we'll pick, that, uh, pick up this idea again soon. Jesus again says, I've said these things to you, and here's another purpose, so that when these things do happen, you'll remember that I told them to you. We see this before in John where, where Jesus will pray things and he'll say, I'm not praying because I'm trying to get an answer out of God. I'm praying so that the people who hear me praying will know what's going on, right? Um, I'm going to go and I'm going to let Lazarus die so that people will benefit from me seeing Lazarus raised from the dead, right? I'm going to tell you that persecution is going to happen so that when it does, you'll remember that I told you it was going to happen. You're not taken by surprise. And, and it reaffirms, oh, everything that Jesus told us was true, right? He goes on in verse 4, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, right? Jesus didn't warn them about this stuff ahead of time. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Makes sense. The disciples are upset. Jesus is leaving. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I, Jesus, go away. For if I do, if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Again, sent from the Son, proceeding from the Son, right? When the Holy Spirit comes, when the helper comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Um, verse 9, concerning sin, because they don't believe in me, Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will no longer see me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. Does anybody know what this means? It's a, I've been reading it over and over, and it, it still kind of doesn't really make sense, what, what he's actually saying. Um, the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He convicts the world concerning sin because they don't believe in Jesus. It seems like, what's that? It seems like it's a function of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of their sin. To point to Jesus, sure. Um, and the sin is probably not believing in Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, concerning righteousness, uh, did I skip one? No. Uh, because I go to the Father. What does Jesus going to the Father have to do with the Holy Spirit convicting the world of righteousness? Right? Like when you, when you, kind of pull it apart and try to figure out what he's saying. It's kind of hard to follow. I think it has something to do with what Jesus is going to bring up again in, in a minute, which is when Jesus returns to the Father, he receives or he, he takes back up the glory that he had prior to the creation of the world. When Christ became human, he set aside glory. He, he set aside part of the splendor with which he was clothed to take on something else, flesh, right? When he goes back to heaven after the resurrection, he still has the flesh, but he is again wrapped in the glory that he had before, okay? I think this might be what he's talking about, although I'm not sure. Right, and, and th so the idea is that he is wrapped in the glory that he had before, and because he has taken it back up, he's gonna say in the future, uh, in a minute, that he's consecrating himself. And because he's doing these things, he can bring other people with him, right? Because he is righteous and because he is in glory and because he is now consecrated, he can bring us, his disciples, with him. I think that might be what he's talking about, convicting the world of righteousness, although I am not sure. And then convicting the world of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Go ahead. The translation? Yeah. Sure. Comes, he will convict the world of his sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. 
all sin is that it was pleasing to him. He believed in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father. This is that context. Right. That part where it says righteousness is available, to me, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. So w what's happening there is that your translator, what, what version is it that you're reading? Okay. So the NLT is, um, is recognizing that this, this sentence doesn't make a lot of sense and is supplying extra words to help it make more sense. So righteousness is available. The, the description of it being available isn't in the, like the original Greek that John wrote down, right? Um, but he's taking the, the interpretive step for you because it doesn't make a lot of sense, which like, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's probably what it's saying. Um, and so the intent of the translation is to accurately represent the idea that's being portrayed. Go ahead. I think by the ruler of the world, he probably means Satan, right? I think, and, and I think he's going to talk about um, keeping us from the evil one later. Um, but yeah, I think he's saying that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of judgment because Satan is already judged. And I guess I'm still trying to figure out what exactly that means. Convicting the world. So not convicting us believers, but convicting the world that they are under judgment because they belong to the one who's already judged. I assume that's what it is. But again, I don't, I don't really understand the mechanics of what the Holy Spirit actually does in interacting with other people. I understand the Holy Spirit lives in us and moves through us and teaches through us and does these sort of things. Um, I don't know that the Holy Spirit goes and interacts with non-believers directly, except through us. So maybe that's a part of it as well, is that us being brought out of judgment is itself a judgment against the people who are still there. Maybe. Maybe that's what he's saying. I think also, isn't there a work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the unbeliever when they come to Christ? So I think there is a convicting when, yes. the Holy Spirit is when someone gets saved. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I, and I think John is, is all for that. Um, where the Holy Spirit, I think everybody agrees, is the initial actor when anyone gets saved. Whether and, and this is part of what we talked about last year with Calvinism and Arminianism and how much the Holy Spirit actually functions. But everybody agrees that the world is sinful to the extent that we cannot believe in God without the help of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who accomplishes that. Um, and to what extent that occurs or whether that occurs for everybody or just for certain people, that's what's up for debate. But everybody agrees the Holy Spirit has to be the initial mover to get anybody involved. Um, so maybe that's what it is, is, is the the grace that the Holy Spirit gives to non-believers so that they can choose Christ is itself a judgment where he's giving them the opportunity to believe and they are being judged based on how they handle that. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's how would they otherwise be convicted of sin? Mm -hmm. Apart from the Holy Spirit, yeah. yeah. Um, let's keep moving forward because we've still got just a ton to cover. Um. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Remember, he just said, I haven't told you the stuff I'm telling you now earlier because you couldn't handle it because I was with you and it didn't really matter. And now there's even more stuff that I should tell you, but I'm not going to because you can't take it. You can't handle it. I imagine part of that might be, oh, I'm about to die and then I'm about to come back from the dead. That sort of stuff you can't really prepare for, right? Like it's best to teach them about what happened afterward, right? Um, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So this seems to be a lot of the same function that Jesus has while he's on earth. Jesus repeatedly says throughout John, I'm not telling you anything of my own authority. I'm telling you what I hear from God. And now the Holy Spirit is going to do the same thing, not speaking on his own authority, but speaking the words that God gives him to tell us. Okay, He will glorify me, this is Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So now, instead of Jesus just delivering the words of God, the Father, to us, the Holy Spirit is delivering the words of God and Christ, 
the Father and the Son, and delivering them both to us. And the purpose is to glorify Christ. Right? So the Holy Spirit is functioning not to bring glory to himself, but glory to the Son. And again, this is what the Son was doing when he was on earth. The Son was functioning not to bring glory to himself, but to bring glory to God. They all operate in humility and submission to each other. And because they are totally in sync in their relationship, nobody ever falls out, right? If you think about human relationships, if you are always serving and being humble and submissive, eventually you get left out, right? Because somebody takes advantage. But in the Trinity, nobody takes advantage. Nobody exerts power over the others. They all operate to humbly submit themselves to each other in order to bring glory to the other members of the Trinity, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't have to worry about bringing glory for himself because the Son will achieve that for the Holy Spirit. The Son doesn't have to worry about achieving glory for himself because the Father and the Spirit will take care of that for him. Does that make sense? I think it's really cool. I think it's a beautiful example of relationship, right? Um, Jesus says in 15, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. I think he probably means his words, his teachings, um, not like property, I don't think. I think he means the things that Jesus is going to say are the things of God, and therefore they'll be declared. Um, in 16, he says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. We all know what this means. Jesus is going to die, and they won't be able to see him. And then a little while later, he'll come back, and they will. This doesn't make any sense to the disciples, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, So this is 17. Some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you'll not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. What? Right. This is what they're saying is, I don't understand what's going on here. Because he's saying, I'm going to the Father. So they were all saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about, right? And again, we kind of see like nobody's brave enough to actually ask Jesus, but he knows that he needs to answer. So in 19, Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. So he says, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you'll see me uh, or you won't see me. And then a little while and you will. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because the hour has come, but when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And that day you will ask nothing of me, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Good? You see the metaphor he's using about childbirth. This is very popular in the New Testament. I'm pretty sure it's popular outside of the New Testament as well. Where, I mean, it's a pretty clear example of going through suffering, knowing what's happening on the other end is better. And then once you get the goal, the baby, the suffering doesn't matter at all, right? You don't even remember, you don't even think about it. Everything pales in comparison. So the disciples are going to suffer. They're going to lament missing Jesus. And when he comes back, it won't matter anymore, right? Everything will be made whole. Their joy will be fulfilled. And I like this um, uh, in verse 22. I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you, right? This, in my mind, is along the same lines of Jesus continuing to say that he will keep you, that it's been his function to keep the disciples and in the same way we'll see in 17, that he will keep all of his disciples, us, right? No one will take your joy from you, right? It's not like somebody can come along and pull that away from you. It's yours given to you by Christ, and no one can take it from you. Good? Okay. 
25, I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf. You see the difference? Before, you asked Jesus for something, and Jesus took the request to the Father. Now he's saying, because, because I have loved you, the Father loves you. So in the same way that the Father hears me, right, I'm the Son, and I can go and ask for anything, but now the Father has chosen to extend that to all of you. So you can ask anything, and in the same way that he will respond to me, his Son, he will respond to you, because you're praying in my name, on my behalf, uh, not on my behalf, um, as if you were me. We look at this in terms of intercession. We say we pray in Jesus' name because then Jesus takes the prayer to the Father on our behalf, which is true. But Jesus is saying we can interact directly with God, and God will treat us as if we are his only son. Right? And Jesus is setting his disciples up for this here. Um, he says in 27, The Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. Your belief means that the Father himself loves you. It's not just that Jesus loves you because you believe in Jesus. The Father loves you because you have believed his Son and that Jesus was sent from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. You see the, this is another little chiasm, right? Um, from the Father to the world, from the world to the Father. Right? And we'll pick back up on this in a minute. So his disciples say in 29, oh, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and don't need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. So Jesus says, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Um, we've been talking about the hour for a while, right? If you recall, I mean, in, in John 2, when Mary comes and says, hey, they ran out of wine, Jesus says, it's not my hour. It's not the time yet, right? Now, Jesus is saying, this is it. The hour has now come, and this is, things are going to change now, right? Um, and he sets them up for, this is now the time, and everyone is going to be scattered, and everybody's going to abandon me, right? And this is what we'll see next week. Um, I appreciate this at the very end, but take heart, I've overcome the world, right? Even before the death and resurrection, even before what we typically attribute, you know, Jesus uh, stole the keys of hell from the devil and conquered death and sin in the grave and all these things that we say. Even now, before the crucifixion, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. Yeah, the world um, has no ability to inflict its will on Christ, right? He, he, he has overcome any ability that the world has to get him off mission, right? He will accomplish what he needs to accomplish, and the world can't do anything to stop it, which I imagine is encouraging for the disciples who are about to watch him get arrested and killed, right? Because again, according to John, that is all part of the plan. The world can't do anything to Jesus that Jesus does not intend and allow, And imagine if you're the disciples and Jesus is telling you these things and you're like, yeah, cool, I believe in all that. And then you see him get arrested and then you see him get tortured and then you see him get murdered. You might question some of these things, right? And say, well, obviously he was wrong. He hasn't overcome the world because he didn't plan for this, right? So it makes sense that Jesus is preparing them and saying, I'm telling you these things now because when they happen, it is going to make a lot more sense. Right? And it's not going to make any sense right now, but it will. Come Sunday, it'll make a lot more sense. Go ahead. Okay.
The meaning was hidden. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. I am of the opinion that the way that Jesus teaches, particularly in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is um, here's my my fun word that I he's obfuscating. In his teaching, he's deliberately making it more difficult to understand to separate the sheep from the goats, right? The people who want to understand more and will come in, and the people who won't. Um, the other fun word that, that I use for this is um, so this is like hard heartedness, right? Um, the reason that he's teaching in parables, what he calls it here, figures of speech, is because the people who don't believe are, be, are, are undergoing this process. They're becoming more hard-hearted by hearing truth and not seeking what it means. Whereas the disciples are coming to get more, right? But you see this throughout, throughout the gospels where Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, good job. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, right? Your own reasoning and internal logic could never have come to this understanding. The Holy Spirit revealed it to you. Right? So I think in that sense, yes, a lot of the stuff that's happening in Jesus' time is hidden from people. That God is, um, I mean, it, it depends on how you want to think about it, keeping a secret, right? That is only going to be revealed later, right? And I think that's kind of how God operates in the Old Testament too, right? It's like he tells people certain things and says, you're not going to see what I'm actually talking about, right? Somebody else is going to benefit from the stuff that I'm telling you, right? I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell Abraham this prophecy. And he's never going to actually get there. He's never going to see the promised land. But he's going to benefit from having heard the prophecy. right? Things, things are hidden. But I think all of the gospel authors will say, after the resurrection, through the Holy Spirit, these things are what's revealed to us as believers. Not, not holy. right? Paul talks about seeing through a, a mirror dimly. right? And we'll see fully when we get to heaven. But as believers now, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we understand a lot more than pretty much anybody we see in the Bible, right? We understand more about Moses than Moses did. The promises made to him and the, the way that God was interacting with him to shape human history. I don't think Moses had a grasp of that the way that we do after the resurrection. Good? Good. I don't know how you feel about that, that God is hiding things from people in order to reveal them later. But like you said, that seems to be something that happens personally as well. That um, in the shape and story of our own lives, I, I wouldn't be here right now if God had told me 10 years ago that I would be here right now, right? But the way that, I, that, that my life has moved and has been brought about by God, this is where I am, right? Um, and, and those things were, were hidden from me in order to get me here. Good. All right, let's move forward with 17 and see if we can get into it. Does anybody have a, a, a header for 17? Using praise to be glorified. Praise to be glorified. High priestly prayer, anybody? Yeah. Um, here Jesus prays. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. He prays for you. Um, people since like the 1600s have called it the high priestly prayer trying to connect it with like the prayers that the priests would make in the temple. Uh, I don't know that that's really how we should think about it. Um, he's interceding for us in heaven now, which is probably more accurate to like the priestly function. Um, and I don't know that that's really what he's doing here is like acting as the priest ready to sacrifice the lamb. I don't, I don't know that that's really what he has in mind, um, but we'll get into it. When Jesus had spoken these words, uh, actually, let's stop there. Um, why does John tell us this? When Jesus had spoken these words. The prayers here in 17 
are connected to everything we've read in 14, 15, and 16. This is not like an isolated unit over here that has nothing to do with what we've just read, right? The prayer is based on all of the teaching that Jesus has just laid down for his disciples. Good. So when Jesus had spoken these things, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. It's here now. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Good? Um, all authority is given to the Son as part of the plan that the Father and Son made before anything on earth ever happened. Before they created anything, the Father and the Son had this arrangement. And even in this moment, before, like, you know, 12 hours before the crucifixion, Christ is on board and ready for what's about to happen, because this is all part of the plan. Before anything was made, before day one, Genesis 1, before creation and before the fall, this is part of the plan, right? Um, now he says, you've given me authority over all flesh, and what's the purpose? Jesus now has authority over all flesh to give eternal life, right? And to whom does Jesus give eternal life? To those the Father gave to Jesus. Um, here and in 6, I think, you get hints of what we would call like predestination, right? God is choosing people and picking them out and giving them to Christ, and then Christ is keeping them. There'll be other verses even here in this prayer that are kind of on the other side of that, where people are having choices and responsibilities. And John has no problem. Jesus has no problem holding those things in tension, okay? But look, uh, he gives them eternal life. What is eternal life? <clears throat> Knowing God. That is not how we think of eternal life. In John, it is. John, even from like John 3, eternal life is not something you get when you die, right? Eternal life is relationship with God that changes who you are now, okay? Um, I've got a quote from my, the commentary that I normally have. Carson says, eternal life is not so much everlasting life, but a personal knowledge of the everlasting person, right? So eternal life is recognizing who God is and having a relationship with him. It's not just about living forever, right? Because I think most of us would assume non-believers live forever also, right? Most of us don't have like this annihilation view where sinners go to hell and then they like stop existing, right? Most of us don't really have that. They do live forever, right? So eternal life can't just be living forever because that's everybody's outcome. Eternal life is different because it's where you end up and with whom you end up. Good? Um, what else do I have? Jesus is returning to God and returning to the glory that he had with God prior to the creation of the world. Um, and I, I continue to be struck by this, that God exists forever, eternal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when Christ comes to earth, he changes. Which is not um, something that we typically ascribe to God, right? Uh, we talk about this in my theology class at school. Um, we call God, here's another big theology word for you, immutable, unchanging, good. Right? This, to me, is one of the most important qualities of God, is that he is consistent. He's faithful. Um, it's great. God is love. Great. Love that about him. Cool. But if God is not consistent, if God can change, then there's no guarantee that God will be love tomorrow. Right? So I really put a lot of stock in God being faithful. Faithful to who he is, faithful to the promises he's made, 
and consistent, unchanging. So it's really, it strikes me and, it, and it's, it's hard to understand, I think, for me, that God, the second person in the Trinity changes, right? He takes on something that he never had before and keeps it forever. Human flesh, right? Christ, the second person in the Trinity, was not Jesus the whole time, right? Jesus was the name given to him as a human being in 4 BC, like we were talking about before we started. Um, but in, in eternity past, he did not have a human body. He became human, right? And, and maybe we could, maybe I could understand that if after the resurrection, he wasn't human anymore and like went back to being like fully God and that was it. But he doesn't. He comes back to heaven with a human body forever. And I don't, and I don't understand that, right? Um, I don't understand how that squares with this because he does change, right? He takes on something that did not belong to him before and keeps it forever. It's part of who he is now. In heaven, in the future, a thousand years from now, in the new heaven and new earth, Jesus has a human body, right? God has a human body. And I don't really understand that, right? And it's just kind of like, we just take it and that's cool. I, I mean, I love it. I'm not saying like it's problematic and I don't like it. I love it a lot, but I also don't understand it. I feel like it's one of those, for me, it's one of those like mysteries that I'm not going to really grasp uh, on this side of heaven, right? Did you have something? Yeah. It's one of those things that we don't understand, that we will understand in the future. Right. And one thing that will make us recognize. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely necessary that Christ become human, Right. And it, and it is beautiful and tragic and humiliating to him. Um, and, and, I, and I love it, obviously. It's great. I just don't understand it, right? And, and that to me is a problem because I try to understand things and it's just, I can't. Uh, go, I think you had your hand up as well. Sure. I think I would disagree with that because I don't think it, being made in the likeness of God, in the image of God, has to do with your physical body. I don't. I don't think so. Um, but I mean, we could talk about that for an hour. Um, this is this is actually exactly what we talked about in my my theology class this week was. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Um, I am of the opinion, though, um, Jesus, uh, sorry, Christ, the second person of the Trinity, always ever intended to come to earth at a specific point in time and look a certain way, right? So even before they ever made Adam, Jesus knew what he would look like. And so I do think that Adam looks the way he does, and the way I describe it is like with arms here and legs down here and a, a head on a little spindly neck. Adam looks that way because Christ intended to look that way. But I don't think it's right historically or, or theologically to say that Christ had a body back then. I think he knew he would have a body, but I don't think, um, because the incarnation is something that changes. The incarnation is a specific point in time where God comes to earth and something does change, right? And so I think, even though it's part of the plan, I don't know that it's, um, it's, a, it, it's an eternal reality for God. Does that make sense as a distinction? This might be a distinction without a difference for a lot of us, I don't know. Go ahead, I and then we gotta... I agree with you, I agree with you. On okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Like us. Hmm. But we know that God doesn't look like us. God is a spirit and doesn't have a body. Right? And so I think I think there's gotta be something different than just like the way that we look as humans. I think it I think throughout history people have argued about this specific thing. I think the general like church history overwhelming position is more along the lines of like we have a spirit, right? Like we can judge morality and we can commune with God. Animals can't really do that. 
Angels can't really do that, but they can kind of, but they don't have bodies. Um, but we don't really know. I mean, we talk about it all the time, especially in our kind of culture. We talk about people being made in the image of God. Um, this is very popular, even with like more progressive, what we would call like liberal denominations. They point to being made in the image of God as a, a push for social justice. From a theological perspective, you have to treat other people well if they're made in the image of God. Um, but I think that is more about dignity and honor and not so much what we look like, but I don't know. Um, I think we need to move forward because it's almost 10. No, no, we're good. I love it. Um, let's get one more section before we go. Yes? Yeah, I, I imagine for Jesus on earth with the disciples, it is difficult to have dear friends whom you know fully, who do not know you fully, right? And I think that is what Jesus is looking forward to. Um, what we see in, in 1724 is he knows Peter fully, and Peter does not know him. And I imagine that that grieves Christ. And so he is praying about this moment in the future, and, and, and we could say specifically for Peter, right? In this moment in the future when Peter will come and see Jesus as he really is. And I imagine that, I mean, like, obviously it's great for Peter, great for us, but I imagine that part of it is also um, joyful for Christ, where people whom you love so deeply finally see you fully for who you are. I imagine that that is also a beautiful moment for him. Um, I could be wrong. Um, let's just do this last uh, two, three verses. In verse six, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Again, God is giving them to Jesus. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So God gave them, but they did something. They kept the word, the, probably the commands that Jesus has given them. Now they know that everything that you've given me is from you, for I've given them the words that you gave me, and they've received them and have come to know the truth that I came from you, and they've believed that you sent me. So they have responsibilities. They're making choices. They are believing, and they are obeying, and they are keeping. Even though, at the same time, we're also saying, Jesus is keeping them, and nothing will take them from his hand. We can also say, they are believing, and they are obeying and keeping themselves. Right? Um, and Jesus says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. There is nobody who believes in Jesus who doesn't also believe in God, and there is nobody who believes in God who does not also believe in Jesus. Period. The people who believe in God and the people who believe in Jesus are a, a perfect circle. It's not a Venn diagram, right? It's everybody all together believing in the same thing. Jesus says, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world because I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. In the same way that the Father and Son are one, Jesus intends for us as believers to be one, right? Um, he also asks God to keep us in his name. I don't think this means, um, there's debate about whether this means like protect us through the power of his name, or whether it means like um, maintain us, keep us where we belong, which is in the name of God. I think it's the latter. 
I think it's keep us believing, right? Keep us as the church. Keep us as the disciples of Christ. Um, but I think we're out of time now. Um, so we will pick up with talking about the name in 12. Okay, so we're on 1712. I'm going to circle it so I don't forget for next week. I think once we get to 18, it goes back to narrative and we'll be able to kind of move more quickly. My plan, at least, all of us kind of know like the the Black Friday and the Easter and the like, we know all the stories from the crucifixion stuff. So I'm just going to kind of pick out the stuff that John tells us that's different from the stories that we generally know. Um, and so we should be able to move more quickly through that. Okay, let's pray and we will go to service.